Thank you both very much, Hadil Ibrahim and Raj Kumar. Uh, riveting conversation, I, I have to say. As we survey the global refugee scene, it's pretty easy to see that it's not pretty. The international response is inconsistent and only sometimes successful. Our next speaker, Professor Alexander Betts, teaches the introduction to the study of forced migration and international relations and forced migration courses for the master's program in refugee and forced migration studies at the University of Oxford in England. At Oxford School of Government, he also teaches the politics and practice of humanitarianism. He's worked for UNHCR and as a consultant to the Council of Europe, UNDP, and UNICEF. He's also had teaching and research positions at Université Libre de Bruxelles, the University of Texas at Austin, and Stanford University. He's just disembarked uh, from, um, from England uh, via Canada and is here today probably because of a highly acclaimed TED Talk he gave just last March, exploring ways societies could empower refugees, empower refugees rather than marginalizing them. Please welcome Dr. Alexander Betts. Good morning, everyone. It's a huge privilege to be part of this wonderful celebration of great humanitarian work. What I want to argue is that the kind of tragedy and chaos we've seen in Europe in the so-called refugee crisis is not inevitable. The over 4,000 people who have drowned crossing the Mediterranean, the suffering we've seen on the Greek islands and across the Balkan route, the collapse of human rights standards in Europe, these are problems of our own making. And I want to further suggest that those problems stem from a simple but deeply misguided assumption held by politicians, the media, and large parts of the general public. And that assumption is as follows. It's the assumption that somehow refugees are an inevitable burden rather than a positive contribution to the societies that host them. And to change that paradigm, we need a movement that rethinks and reconceives refugees in a way where we recognize their skills, talents, and aspirations, and ensures that the host communities share in those benefits and contributions. In order to make that argument, I want to take you on a tour that will begin in the Netherlands, move to Uganda, on to Jordan, and then I'll conclude with a tentative vision for how we can change that paradigm from burden to benefit. So this image looks like it would have been taken last year in Europe on the Balkan route, but it's actually 17 years ago when over 800,000 Kosovar refugees fled mainly to other parts of Europe, a predominantly Muslim population fleeing in their hundreds of thousands to Europe, and somehow Europe coped. It was a challenge, but prior to 9-11, prior to the toxic environment and framing of refugees, Europe was able to cope. At the time, I was a 19-year-old undergraduate, and like many students, I had a lot of free time and not much money. So I had an opportunity to spend the summer as a volunteer doing very simple work in a refugee camp, um, a welcoming center for asylum seekers in the Netherlands. I didn't know much about who a refugee was or what refugees were, but while I was there, rather than feeling a sense of pity, I was deeply inspired by the people I met. I met people from Kosovo, from Bosnia, from China, from Pakistan, from Liberia, from what was then Zaire. And I was deeply inspired. A former Iranian Olympian taught me the basics of table tennis. A Bosniak lawyer taught me the basics of public international law. And I came away thinking, how was it the case in the Netherlands at that time that people with those talents and those contributions to offer were stuck in bureaucratic limbo, sometimes for years unable to work? But as I came away from that situation, I found that it was even worse as we moved to the developing world where today 86% of the world's refugees are. In camps around the world, like the Ali Ade camp in Djibouti, near the border with Somaliland, refugees are often housed for five, 10, 15, 20 plus years. They're born, they grow up, they become adults in camp environments. 
and they often don't get access to solutions. In this particular CAM, a very little known CAM, home to about 10,000 Ethiopians and Somalis, one of the people living there is a Somali lander called Wuli, who you see in a tent in front of a blackboard. And when I was there, Wuli said to me, man doesn't live on food and, hope alone, food and water alone, but on hope. My hope is gone, but I choose to pass it to the next generation. Because Wooly had arrived as an 18-year-old in 1988, and he's been there ever since. And he has health problems, but rather than giving up, he teaches English and maths informally to refugee kids who would otherwise be denied a secondary education. And so we need to take that innovation, that capacity we see in places like Aliada, and try to advance it and embrace capacities rather than just seeing vulnerabilities. It's of course worth recognizing that while refugees come to Europe, come to North America, the bulk of the challenge is in the developing world. Just 10 host countries host nearly 60% of the world's refugees. And yet the international system is poorly adapted to address their needs. Two brief data points for you that are little known. We spend around 135 US dollars for every, on, in Europe, on asylum seekers, for every dollar we spend on refugees in the developing world. That's not to say we shouldn't be spending the $135, but it means we're misallocating resources in not prioritizing the majority. Furthermore, while we think there's a system that protects refugees in those host countries, if we turn to Turkey, today the largest refugee hosting country in the world, less than 10% of Syrian refugees in Turkey receive any assistance whatsoever from international organizations. When you realize that, you realize the gaps in our coverage and the system that we offer to refugees around the world. So together with my team at the Refugee Studies Center in Oxford, we asked ourselves how research and data could contribute to changing this paradigm. And so we've undertaken research over the last three years in Uganda. Why Uganda? Not because it's representative. It's not representative host states around the world. It's exceptional. Uganda has adopted a different way of hosting refugees in what it calls a self-reliant strategy. It gives refugees the right to work and freedom of movement. And so it's a chance to explore what happens if we give to refugees basic socioeconomic freedoms. And in order to explore that, rather than just go in as researchers with clipboards and collect data and leave, we built a research community amongst the refugees themselves, training them not just as enumerators, but as peer researchers, and building a team that we've worked with over a long period of time to access the community, ensure data is accurate, and actually leave a positive legacy within the community. Too often we do self-reliance research without promoting self-reliance, and we wanted to do it differently. We were able to look at three contexts through qualitative and quantitative research the urban context by looking at the capital city Kampala, long-term protracted settlements in Nakivali and Changwali in the southwest of the country, and also an emergency camp environment, Ramanja. And so that enabled us to see what happens when refugees have socioeconomic opportunities in those quite different types of refugee context. And what we found is fascinating, and I think transformative. We were able to challenge five basic myths commonly held in public discussions about refugees' economic lives. The first myth is the idea that refugees' economic lives are isolated. Even in remote settlements and camps, they are connected. The fabric you see in the photograph is a ceremonial fabric that Congolese call Batenge. When we asked NGOs where Batenge comes from, they said it probably comes across the border from the Democratic Republic of Congo. But when we asked refugees themselves, we got a different answer. They told us that they import Betenge through refugee-run supply chains from as far afield as factories in India and China into the Aweno market in Kampala, along supply chains into local towns, Barara and Hoima, and into the settlements where they run wholesale structures. The second myth we were able to challenge is the idea that refugees are an edible burden. We found in our survey that in Kampala, 21% of refugees run a business that employs at least one other person. And of those they employ, 40% are Ugandan nationals. In other words, refugees are making jobs for host citizens. 
they're also helping themselves through informal structures. On the right is a street in the Somali area, Kisenyi, where a group of women running businesses have set up something called an ayuto, a social protection mechanism, so that they pay in savings, and when one woman or one family hit hard times, they can withdraw from that social protection mechanism to support themselves and their family. The third myth we were able to challenge is economic homogeneity. We often assume refugee settlements are rather like the sort of Soviet Kolkots where everyone's a farmer and everyone's equal. And it's literally not the case. Yes, the average income is generally low. We found it to be about $29 a month. But there's a huge spectrum below that and indeed some outliers who are doing very well. And they're earning their livelihoods in different ways. This is Demu K, a Congolese guy who, arriving with very little in the Nakivali settlement, has set up a community radio station and started making documentary films. He had to rent his video camera at first, but now he's beginning to save money to buy his own equipment. The fourth myth we were able to challenge is the idea that refugees are technologically illiterate. Wherever they have the opportunity, they use SMS and the internet, not just for social networks, but also as part of their primary livelihoods activities. They transfer money using SMS. They share business information. They stay in touch with their clients and their customers. Now, the challenge with the internet is it's rarely available with broadband connection in the settlements. But where it's available in urban areas, it's used. And where refugees only have access to low levels of technology, they adapt them innovatively. In this photo, you see a picture of a Congolese refugee with a bicycle adapted to sharpen tools. As I rather foolishly discovered, if you cycle the pedals in the wrong direction, the sparks fly into your face, but they're not as foolish as an Oxford academic. <laughs> the fifth myth we were able to challenge is the idea that refugees are inevitably dependent. They're not. We found that less than 1% of refugee households have no form of independent income generating activity. You simply can't live on World Food Program rations. You can't live on humanitarian handouts. And so most refugees, when they have some opportunity to work, don't live on those handouts. They try and support themselves and their families. Most notably, we were able to find from our work what explains variation in refugees' economic outcomes. When do they thrive versus merely survive? And what should be striking from this is that there is that variation in income. Refugees in urban areas generally do better, those in protracted settlements a bit worse, and those in emergency camps struggle the most, having just arrived, and often in this case, being in remote locations. But what's interesting is the levers that one can pull to change that, the variables and factors that determine differences in income. And they're the following. Education is hugely salient. The returns to education for refugees are significant and from the data in Uganda, greater than for nationals of the host country. We found, for instance, that the returns to education go up the further you progress through the education system. So for an additional year of tertiary education, a refugee can expect to receive, on average, an additional 6.2% in income each year. Occupation matters. Farmers do worse. Self-employed non-farmers generally do better. Years in exile matter. There's an initial benefit to being a refugee, to income, but it declines over time and turns negative. As we leave people in exile, it seems we lose their human capital. It's, there's an attrition rate, and we need to make, make sure that we get people out of exile as early as we can. Gender matters. In terms of livelihoods, we're neglecting women, and men, particularly married men, do much better. But the key to all this is regulation. We have to have enabling environments in which refugees can help themselves. And we were able to explore this even in one country because we looked at three different contexts. In the urban context, refugees face the greatest degree of freedom. They're de facto integrated alongside the hosts. At the other end of the spectrum, in the emergency camp, Ramanja, they face the greatest degree of restrictions, the greatest limitations on their movement, the greatest degrees of harassment when they tried to set up businesses and hence they really struggled holding other factors constant. But not every country in the world is like Uganda. What does this mean elsewhere, for instance, with the Syrian refugee challenge? At the moment, Syrian families face 
an almost impossible choice about where to go. They can choose between three basic options. First, encampment in contexts like the Zatari camp, home to 83,000 Syrian refugees. Now, the camp is where humanitarian assistance is traditionally provided. That's the one advantage it offers. But refugees don't have economic freedoms. They don't have the right to work in most camps. And living somewhere like Zatari, you can still hear mortar shells on the other side of the border at night. So only about 9% of Syrian refugees actually choose to live in those camps. The second choice is to move to an urban area. The problem with urban areas, like Amman, for instance, is that refugees don't have an easy access to work permits or the ability to support themselves in the formal economy. And so many Syrian refugees, having depleted their savings, the capital they brought with them, really struggle and face destitution. And so the third option they're left with, as a last resort, is often to embark on dangerous journeys. And that's what we've seen in Europe. But there are still economic opportunities in countries like Jordan. They're not as ideal as those we've seen in Uganda. But in April last year, I traveled with my colleague, the development economist Paul Collier, to Jordan. And we visited many of the usual camps that people are taken to. But what also struck us was that just 15 minutes from Zatari was an economic zone called the King Hussein bin Talal Development Area. And it lacked two basic things, labor, and foreign direct investment. And so we put two and two together, and we may well have come up with five, but the idea was that why couldn't refugees, those 83,000 Syrian refugees, have the chance to work alongside Jordanian host nationals in those economic zones? Why couldn't that be a way of breaking the mold in a country like Jordan, reluctant to offer jobs to refugees? So we wrote an article in Foreign Affairs and put it to um, the government in Jordan, the British government, a number of NGOs and international organizations, and it's got somewhere as an idea. The idea is to create investment from outside by businesses, a trade carve-out in the European Union, which has been achieved now in the garment sector, infrastructural investment coming from the World Bank and elsewhere, to help Jordan see refugees as a benefit, make the leap to being a manufacturing country, which it struggled to do for a long time, and this is un the way as a pilot that's taking place to try and create 200,000 jobs in Jordan today. It's a second best solution, but it's a way of opening up autonomy and jobs to refugees. So what are the implications of this? I think first of all, we need to recognize that refugees have capacities rather than just vulnerabilities. They're an issue for development rather than just humanitarianism. We have to see that in the 1951 Refugee Convention, the entire second half of the convention is about socioeconomic rights and autonomy that refugees rarely get. And to actually realize that vision, that vision that's central to the refugee regime, we need to create jobs and education in the places where the majority of the world's refugees are today. But different models will work differently in different contexts. What works in Uganda will be different in Jordan, will be different in countries like Kenya or Ethiopia. But there's real promise here. At the Obama summit last week, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Thailand, all made slight but hopeful pledges to support opportunities for jobs and greater autonomy to the refugees they host. What I've argued is almost embarrassingly simple. It's that refugees are human beings, and if we help them to help themselves, they will thrive and support themselves and their communities. Thank you very much.